So first of all, I'm Erin Turner. I'm your moderator. I'm from the Consumer Policy Research Centre in Australia. And we're joining us today. We have Rajiv Dada. Recording in progress. Trustworthy Shopping Experience International Expert from Amazon. Rosemary Mopoku, the Chief Executive Officer from the Consumer Council of Zimbabwe. Jan Cheke, Cheke, the Economist and Policy Analyst from the OECD. And joining us online will be Manorama Mathur Dabadin, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Commerce and Consumer Protection from the Government of Mauritius. However, to start us off, we'll be joined by Rena Etel, the Deputy Director General for Cross-Sectoral Consumer Policy Issues from the Government of Germany. Rena, would you like to open with a speech? Thank you, Erin, for the nice introduction. Dear panelists, dear ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation to the Consumers International Global Congress. I'm pleased about the possibility of speaking today as a representative of the German Consumer Protection Ministry. This is an opportunity for an exchange on current trends, challenges and solutions in the field of consumer protection in an increasingly digitalized world. Today, we'll have a discussion about how to strengthen consumer trust in product safety. In times of globalization and rapidly opening new markets, this is more important than ever. I would like to encourage you to ask your questions and share your experiences in the Q&A session following to the discussion on the panel. Let us develop good ideas for further strengthening consumer protection in a way that ensures consumers are given the best possible support. On the one hand, online marketplaces make people's lives a lot easier, enabling consumers to get a better overview of the market, compare goods and services, and access products more easily. On the other hand, businesses and consumer advocates often have to contend with unsafe or recalled products remaining on sale or reappearing on the same markets after only a short interruption. To address this problem at international level, a number of voluntary agreements have been signed with online marketplaces with a view to protecting consumers from unsafe products. Ensuring a high level of consumer protection is also our goal in the European single market. For that reason, the European Union supports voluntary commitments by online marketplaces. Such voluntary commitments include the Product Safety Pledge and the Product Safety Pledge Plus. The businesses signing these commitments have taken a major step towards greater consumer protection. As a new member state, Germany has transposed into national law the EU's General Product Safety Directive. But under the current legislation, online marketplaces do not have any obligations regarding the safety of the products sold on their interfaces. Therefore, the measures that are taken by national market surveillance authorities are of crucial importance. These authorities are able to take action also under the existing legislation on the basis of the EU market surveillance regulation. Especially if no other means are available and a serious risk is posed by a given online content, national authorities may require the website to remove that content or clearly display a warning. However, online marketplaces are exempt from obligations regarding product safety until the new EU general product safety regulation becomes applicable. The product safety pledge, which has applied since 2018, helps to counteract this problem. The signatory companies commit to going beyond their legal obligations to better protect consumers from any unsafe products sold online on their interfaces. For instance, they commit to respond within two days if notified by a market surveillance authority of an unsafe product to remove the product from their website to cooperate with national authorities and to take action against repeat offenders. 
And meanwhile, the signatories of the Product Safety Pledge Plus have entered a set of strengthened and expanded commitments in the field of product safety. These include proactively reviewing their sites for product recalls, for example, with the help of the information provided by the EU Safety Gate, and setting up internal notice and takedown mechanisms. The Product Safety Pledge and the Product Safety Pledge Plus provide a solid and effective basis for better cooperation between online marketplaces and national authorities. This is a positive development for German market surveillance, which, incidentally, is also very active. In fact, Germany continues to identify and report the largest number of unsafe products compared to other EU member states. However, the limited number of signatory detracts from the effectiveness of voluntary commitments. Despite the progress made, it is vital to continuously improve consumer protection and adapt it to the latest developments. In order to meet new challenges with an adequate legal framework, the EU has revised the existing General Product Safety Directive and recently launched a new General Product Safety Regulation. The new regulation will be applicable from the end of 2024. The experience gained with the Product Safety Pledge has prompted the inclusion of several previously voluntary obligations in the new regulation. During the negotiations, Germany keenly supported strengthening consumer rights and committing all online marketplaces to greater product safety. One of the su successes of the negotiations was ensuring that online marketplaces will now have to conduct random reviews as to whether a product sold on their platform has been reported unsafe. To remove such unsafe products, they will need to take suitable measures and establish internal processes for product recalls. So for Germany, the new regulation is a major success. We have seen that feedback and experience gained in the content of voluntary commitments can positively influence the adoption of legal provisions for enhanced consumer protection. The example of the product safety pledges in the EU shows that an international voluntary approach to improving consumer protection can be worth the effort and lead to tangible results. However, there are still no general monitoring obligations for online marketplaces. This is why, despite the new legal framework, we consider the safety pledges are a necessary tool for ensuring the greatest possible product safety, especially for consumers, but also for economic actors. Dear ladies and gentlemen, in a world that is in a constant flux, a world in which consumers and businesses, consumer educates and market surveillance authorities are always faced with new and increasingly complex challenges, the capacity to adapt is vital for ensuring adequate protection of our rights and interests. A consumer-friendly, sustainable future is our common goal. This conference offers an opportunity to share experiences and ideas and to shape an environment in which every consumer can act safely and with confidence. At the end of my remarks, I would like to propose the following question for discussion. What should be the key components for an effective framework for preventing unsafe products from reaching consumers and causing harm? And can this be agreed at international level? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Attell. Uh, a fantastic question was posed to us at the end of that speech. And I might go first to our expert from Mauritius. Hello, Manorama. Uh, very interested in your views. What do you think should be the key components of an effective product safety framework? And can we agree on those at an international level? Thank you. Thank you for inviting us uh, to participate in the conference. And my apologies for not being able to attend the conference in person uh, due to enforcing circumstances. But I'm grateful that I'm being, uh, we are being given the opportunity to intervene at this important session. 
and of the conference. So uh, your question was, what should be the key components for an effective uh, framework for preventing unsafe products from reaching consumers? Looking at the issue from a human, human rights perspective, which is essentially based on three principles, that of being universal, indivisible, and interdependent, and referring to specific articles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the application that, to the effect that if citizens around the world should have equal treatment to the right to safety, that the same level of legal protection should be applied wherever we are in the world. I would like to highlight that with globalization, international trade and development of in, in information communication technologies, the need for uh, production, the sale distribution of genuine safe products and services globally has become essential with a view to protect consumers around the world. So, um, Existing framework, we do have at our level legislations, national legislations, and we abide to regional uh, trade block uh, legislation and guidelines. We have, uh, there are a number of, uh, for a number of products, there are norms and standards. Authorities are here to ensure application of these norms and standards. There is border control. There are mandatory clearances for products which, for which we have conformity certificates. Market surveillance is there, depending on the product, the existing legislation and rules, and uh, depending on jurisdiction. Agreements are there. And the level of awareness of consumers is not uh, is there, but not to the level that we that are required. We need that the challenges that we find is of heterogeneity of markets, of laws, of uh, the consumers, their needs and wants, the different levels of responsibilities and obligations for each stakeholder involved in global uh, distribution, uh, in the production and distribution. Chain. The laws differ across jurisdiction and we, we, we see that, especially in the context of online selling, e-commerce, it is a very complex issue and difficult to implement. E-commerce and specificities of actors in online supply chain is another challenge. The different level of control depending on laws of a country, on the custom and border, the, the, the laws which are applicable in the different uh, jurisdiction. We have also the application of norms and standards which are not consi consistent across the world. Uh, these differ from country to country. Market surveillance also depends on the product, on the, le uh, the legislative um, framework in that country, the rules, uh, jurisdiction again. The costs involved and capacity to enforce laws and rules differ from country to country. The knowledge and competence of enforcement staff also differ. Consumer awareness and uh, information available impact also on, on safety, on the product safety and uh, their utilization. The control on quality and safety of the product services produced by the business community. In many cases, we do not have control on the quality and safety of product 
and services produced by the business community, especially if in countries like Mauritius where we import a, number, a lot of uh, the products that we consume. The level of commitment of each actor also is very important, but is a challenge. So according to us, the key components that are essential for effective uh, protection is uh, an enhancement, enhanced ver ver All right. I'm so sorry. We've lost the audio just there. Um, I'm just looking. Can you hear me? Ah, <laughs> hello. You're back. I'm sorry. We missed. We missed your last thought. Would you like to add anything else? So the key components that we we think we need to enhance the version, an enhanced version of all the components mentioned above that I've just mentioned. We need a global legislative framework, a global institution that will have an overall uh, view and will uh, be able to enforce uh, globally all the, the, what is unsafe for consumers in a country is also unsafe for consumers in all other countries. Because all human beings so equal rights. We have to recognize also and, and give uh, and comply to intellectual property rights uniformly. And uh, um, there is need for harmonized product safety requirement because it's not the same in each and every country. We need a harmonized market surveillance approach that encompass digital as well as traditional supply chains the education and awareness of consumers should be enhanced further. Information on product safety uh, should be shared globally, not to limit a number of uh, countries. There should be clearly defined responsibility and liabilities for all actors, clearly defined uh, efficient management of product recall process and systems, sanctions to businesses not being to product safety norms and standards, and uh, mediation, redress process outside courts of law. Product safe should not be allowed to create national laws on product safety. Countries inability to set mandatory standards at local or national level, or because of lack of resources to enforce norms and standards, or capabilities. So, um, I'm so sorry, you're, you're breaking up there, so we might come back to you. But I particularly wanted to thank you for your important point that a product that's unsafe in one country is unsafe everywhere. It's a really, I think, an important point to start with. I'll go to the, the panel in person here. I, I'd love your thoughts on that, that key question. What are the core components of an effective product safety framework? And can we agree on this internationally? Jan, could you start us off, please? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you, CI, for having us here. And thank you for this great question, which is really a question I think the OECD has been working on for over 40 years. So we had the first recommendations on product safety back in 79, I think, around that time. Um, but it has all been bits and pieces. And I can now report in this, the nice part in 2020, the OECD um, had an, kind of an, quite an overarching recommendation on consumer product safety, bringing these different elements together and precisely uh, pointing out the key components that should be part of such a framework. And the key components that were mentioned in this recommendation is ensuring that businesses do their part, that they have safe product practices. So that means in the first place, the products put on the market should be safe. The recommendation actually talks about a right of consumers to expect that products that they buy are safe. And then if something goes wrong, businesses, there needs to be something in place that, that makes businesses retract those products from the market. 
The second component is uh, more related to the government part. So there's a role for government. You need an authority that has the power, for example, to say this product is really unsafe. We need to withdraw it from the market. And what is, if it's appropriate, it's good to have something like an exchange on product safety information, like a recall portal or something. This is something that on the government side is, is quite helpful. The third component uh, focuses on consumers. And here the, the issue is consumers need access to the right safety information. So I'm talking about disclosures on uh, labels, warning signs, kind of maintenance information, these type of things. They need to be in place so that consumers can take informed decisions. The fourth component that OECD countries at least kind of agreed upon is also important. It's about risk assessment and risk management. And this is a thing that needs to be, it's a shared responsibility, has to be taken into account by both businesses and the government. And it's also something that is important to highlight. It should happen along the whole product lifetime. So we're talking from design of the product until the last uh, stage. And finally, I think corrective actions, recalls, they need to be, something needs to be in place that those are uh, effective, that's important. The products need to be removed from the market, repaired, replaced, whatever the solution is. Consumers need to be effectively informed, and there's OECD guidance on how this effective information can look like. And of course, you would want to make sure that those unsafe products don't return to the market. So the, you need to trace them and see that you get rid of them for good. And then the recommendation also highlights uh, Global awareness, so consumer awareness, raising awareness this is something that was mentioned by Manorama. Um, and we have OECD runs like regular global awareness campaigns every one or two years. Every country is invited to participate in those. And the recommendation further, further highlights the need for international cooperation, uh, exchange of information. There we have an OECD global recalls portal, 47 kind of jurisdictions put their data on recalls in that portal. And again, this is open to all countries, not, not just OECD countries. So I think in short, uh, kind of an agreement on key components is possible, at least it was possible at the OECD level. Though, of course, as uh, Manorama said, it's not a global legislative framework. Frameworks differ quite a lot from country to country, so that you need some flexibility there. Thank you. Rajdeep, can I bring you, you in now from a, a business perspective? What's your view on this question? Thanks for that. Can you hear me well? Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank CI for just organizing and the entire logistics and how we are managing this grand show. Um, I would also thank the team for putting this session and putting this impetus to just think how globally this is the right thing to think of. And I think uh, uh, Rainer just started this well to say what kind of things are happening on the regulatory side and then how these pledges in Europe and Amazon has signed other four pledges in Canada recently, uh, Japan and Australia. So how these are complementing and, and how this is big, uh, making a bigger framework for us to operate. And my charter is international, so this question is qu quite relevant and how Manorama posed it that what is unsafe somewhere is also unsafe globally. So how do you bring all of this together and how do you ensure customer is in the center of the process? So just to give a background, uh, we signed the uh, Euro pledge in 2018. Uh, however, at that time, all the regulation was not framed. But from 18 to now, when, when we got that data or the signals, we understood what we should build in DSA or GPSR. So I think sometimes these are f uh, f front runners of uh, what kind of regulation come to, and then you have more data, and then you frame those regulations. And now we are signing Pledge Plus. And uh, on that pledge plus, there are certain pilots that we are doing, doing with consumer groups. Because we know the experts are somewhere uh, in consumer groups, manufacturers, brand owners, who can tell us more about that industry or that specific product. And, and one of the frameworks or components that we should discuss is about collaboration. So going back on that, from our Amazon's perspective, our three main components are innovation. So we start from customer. Customer is in the center of our process and we invent on their behalf. So customers are giving feedback. There are recalls happening. Uh, we know the product reviews, uh, complaints, uh, globally what's happening in the external world. So we take all of those signals to ensure that our listing processes are better and we can educate our sellers. So going to the next component, it is about collaboration, that how do we work with regulators, government bodies, consumer forums, trade unions, businesses, and how do we share that data uh, so that it is global in nature. What's happening today in one of the continents 
uh, with this e-commerce and borderless commerce, it will come somewhere else, and sellers and customers are everywhere. So it is important that we share that data, and it is electronically transferred so that uh, it is better managed. Uh, and we talked about frameworks and regulations which can govern those kind of uh, data protection. And the last part is uh, communication. I think it is very important uh, where we tell customers how to use the product. The products may be safe, but we, we don't know how do we use it. Or we are doing certain of this messaging uh, in some parts of the world, which we have to now bring it across the world. Uh, something in Japan we do is Anshin Mail. Uh, like how do you tell customers that uh, when did you last buy, what is the expiry date, uh, how can you uh, subscribe it again, et cetera. So how do you go slightly more um, granular depending on the product type and the customer preference and give them those kind of emails, notification in time, and also educate sellers because sellers need to know what does it mean to sell a particular product in a particular country and what kind of norms they need to take care of. So. I think the three main components are innovation or technology, uh, collaboration with multiple bodies who work in this ecosystem, and communication and education to ensure this is rightly communicated to the uh, stakeholders in right time. Thank you. Last but definitely not least, Rosemary, can you give us a consumer representative perspective on this? What are the key components of an effective product safety framework? Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, let me begin saying um, all the efforts that the consumer protection movement has made in ensuring product safety. If we are not careful and we embrace with a lot of joy um, the online uh, purchases that we are now doing, it has come with a lot of achievements, really, the digital space. But uh, if we are not careful, all the efforts that we've been making over the years of trying to ensure that consumers are protected, particularly from unsafe products, may be drained away by online shopping. We need to ensure that um, we take up the issues of product safety in that space. We realize that there is a lot of um, fraudulent marketing and ethical behavior where products are marketed as something else that they are not. We are seeing a lot of counterfeit products on the market, sometimes deceptive um, you know, processes are used, false claims, even green claims that are not real. And we find that there is a lot that is happening. And if we are not careful, all these um, bad things or the disadvantages may end up you know, overweighing the goodness that has come about with online um, purchasing. So it's important that we look at things like the legislation that surrounds uh, consumer protection. It does not mean that if, it's, if, it's, if something is being sold online, the, the responsibilities that should be taken into account go away. In fact, those same responsibilities must apply for online products to ensure that we have product safety and to ensure that even the global village is covered. Because with online shopping, they, that knows no borders and consumer protection becomes even more key. If we are not careful, consumers will continue to be vulnerable and continue to be exposed because of these borderless um, markets. So it is important that we have harmonized standards across our borders. We do have frameworks for that. For example, the ISO community which is doing that work already. If, as consumers, we demand that all online products must adhere to mandatory standards, I think that would solve our biggest problems that we are having because, because of these um, borderless um, markets. We are faced with a lot of um, 
instances where some countries which do not have proper legislation frameworks get you know, products being dumped into their countries through online markets, all because consumer protection legislative frameworks are weak in those countries. At a time when we are supposed to be working towards harmonizing and encouraging and helping each other as nations to tighten our consumer protective legislation, we are now faced with online markets, which are now you know, eating back all the, the efforts that have been made. So my last comment would be to say that online marketing knows no borders. Let us have an international legislation. I know this would be very debatable because it might seem very far from us or far-fetched, but it may end up being the only solution for us to protect every consumer in the world. Thank you. Thank you. I actually want to take us, we've, we've heard a few points today about the voluntary initiatives that are happening in some countries. Um, product safety pledges is a good example. Jan, can I get your thoughts? How effective are these non-regulatory initiatives in improving product safety? I think there, there is definitely a role for, for non-regulatory initiatives. I think, of course, a solid regulatory framework should be the first. So you, you, you need that in the first instance. But then regulation can fall behind if you have quick market dynamics. You know, regulation can't keep up sometimes. Governments have limited resources. Implementation and uh, enforcement can be quite challenging. Um, and so, for example, in, in 2021, we had over 20 jurisdictions from OECD countries and others engaging in a global uh, online sweep. So they were looking in the internet for products that are unsafe. And they were, they were finding that about 87% of products that were banned or recalled were still somehow available online. Um, often on marketplaces, you have access to third-party sellers sitting in other countries. Um, so th this type of issue, and I think this is a place where the where it's a quite important role for non-voluntary uh, initiatives, and the product safety pledges are a good example. They're popping up in a number of countries now. There is voluntary commitments that marketplaces engage in, and actually also in 2021, the OECD um, had a communique on those pledges where they basically highlighted that this is a good idea indeed. Um, and they highlight four key commitments, and they're kind of they don't align exactly with the commitments you would find in, in the existing pledges, but they summarize them a bit on a, on a high level. I can give you a, a, a broad uh, overview, but, but the, the general idea is to have like a bit of consistency between the pledges across countries. But the first kind of the commitment rela relates again to detecting unsafe products. So marketplaces commit to do their job, uh, get rid of unsafe products that they have, potentially using automated tools to flag unsafe products, and also Rainer Ettel mentioned before the proactivity of going to recalls portals and so on and, and check the data there. The second is the cooperation with consumer product safety organizations, and, and Raj mentioned that before, so having, for example, a unique contact point for those um, authorities and also reacting to requests for takedown of products in a short time frame. We're typically talking about two to three days. Um, the third, raising third-party seller awareness, also something that, that Raj has mentioned before. Um, so, for example, by adding related content on product safety into the guidelines that are sent out to third-party sellers or in the training materials and so on, this, this is one of the commitments that, that you will always or often find. And then the fourth one relates to empowering consumers on the product safety issues. Uh, here, for example, marketplaces could add functionality for consumers to flag a product that they think um, may be dangerous. And if you look at the annual reports of those pledges, there really seems to be a progress there. So there is quite an effectiveness there. And I think more broadly, if you have a non-regulatory initiatives, and I'm including other initiatives there, like awareness campaigns, and they go beyond legal requirements, obviously they should do that. And then importantly, if they can leverage kind of reach of businesses or technologies of businesses uh, or tools that are not available to consumers, I think then they can be quite effective. But it's always important also to have like a measure to measure the effectiveness. Thank you. Uh, Raj, you're involved in a number of product safety pledges and uh, those non-regulatory initiatives. Can I get your thoughts on the effectiveness of these and how they may have, uh, say, particularly assisted with cooperation between businesses and regulators? For sure. I think um, 
Amazon's cornerstone has been uh, keeping customer in front, the most um, customer-centric uh, organization, and then inventing on their behalf. So there were some of these mechanisms we already had, like customer reviews or customer complaints, and how do you build those signals and ensure you're scanning your selection and catalog um, every second, and so you know when the uh, when the item is changing some of its key attribute, I, I'm, I'm taking a very simple one, although it is not a safety thing. Uh, let's say the title of the product says it's a yellow shirt, and the image uh, uploaded is a red shirt. So you directly know that there is something going wrong here because the product is not same as it's listed. And then we take some action, we inform the seller and selling partner, and then we do corrective action. So there's a continuous algorithm of uh, image tech, large learning models, which is working. And then when we, and as uh, Jan put it very rightly, with, when OECD put the communique on this entire uh, product safety pledges, I think it helped to kind of create a framework or governance model around these initiatives and how one country was leveraging from another country. And almost these are similar with some of the tweaks to local and regional models. Uh, and it has helped us to put a frame and put some thresholds, uh, like Amazon is one of the partners. There are other 10 businesses who have signed in Europe. So those businesses are giving those inputs. So you collectively get more intelligence out of these uh, processes, and it helps you to put better detection models. And um, the uh, most important thing is how do you educate customers about it? So we have started putting things like videos along with the six-sided images. There are detailed pages which talk more about uh, how the product needs to be used. There are question and answers or product reviews which where uh, you crowdsource some of the information. But customers really do understand how do you utilize it, how do you, uh, if it's a DIY kind of an item, how do you use it? Kids Save Products has been one of our initiatives around all of that. And also telling sellers, because there are regulations, but sometimes those regulations are not holistic, till you know more about these innovative products. Like today, on many products like school bags or um, umbrellas, we have seen that we are getting lithium ion or button battery. So it is important to educate sellers as well that while you list such products, how do you clearly give out that attribute? Because then it helps us on storage, on delivery, on customer uh, returns, et cetera. So the entire ecosystem kind of uh, helps when you get into those voluntary processes and frameworks, because that would, I, I always feel that's like the forerunner or the precursor to what kind of regulations need to be formed. And some of the countries where some of the initial building blocks have not been done, they can all uh, take a leap out of it or they can, uh, jump to the next level of uh, process rather than reinventing some of these regulations throughout the way. So I think it works. It has helped us. And I'm actually encouraging more other countries to sign those pledges or take some of these frameworks which has worked because it will at least put some minimum standards into this process. Actually, this is a perfect point to get views from the floor, attendees from other countries who work in product safety. Um, now we have roving microphones, so please put your hand up if you'd like to to ask a question, and people will come to you. Um, can we go to the front, please, Peter, to start? Peter, thank you. Thank you, my name is Arnaud Tairi, and I work for ANCTA, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Um, and I'd like to put a word on the value of soft law um, in inspiring local models. So we have the UN guidelines for consumer protection that were adopted in 1985, and they had really been the base for many legislations around the world. Right now at AMCTAD we host an informal working group on consumer product safety and in its work program there is a general recommendation on uh, consumer product safety which is going to draw from the experience of the OECD but then probably be applicable to all 195 member states of AMCTAD but there's also a model law proposal to implement a 2020 recommendation at AMCTAD on preventing the distribution of known unsafe uh, consumer products that are traded across borders. Um, this is the case where uh, products that have been found unsafe in one jurisdiction may be re-exported to a jurisdiction who has less capacity to act upon that safety concern. And it really brings to the fore the power of uh, multilateral cooperation in this. So even if we don't get an international legislation, there are many ways that we can still move forward in this. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rosemary, I, I, really, I would love to bring you in and get your views on what do, you, what do you think about the value of voluntary initiatives and where we need to step up to mandatory? Thank you very much for that. That would really be ideal if we have manufacturers who voluntarily come up with initiatives of protecting consumers from unsafe products. For example, um, testing of products must be encouraged across all products that are sold online. If products are tested, then maybe we get certification, a certification marks that talk to, 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 to the conformity of those products to a certain standard. I'm sure as consumers, just as we have done in other areas, such as medicines, I know for sure that the area of medicines is highly protected uh, through testing and all of those requirements that are, uh, you know, that are mandatory for anybody to trade in medicine. The same um, system could be used for other products where we, we start off with companies that are manufacturing, voluntarily testing and conforming to certain standards to give consumers the trust and the confidence for them to know that indeed these products have passed you know, the, the tests that have uh, be, been done and they are indeed safe. Thank you. <laughs> we have another question from the floor. And then we'll come here. Hello. Uh, I'm Anita from NGP India. I have a suggestion uh, to ensure the product safety, the process of setting, setting up the international standards for the products should be more uh, effective uh, by, through the way of uh, a committee like ISO Copelco, mm -hmm. Mirror Committee, and also the United Nations guidelines on this uh, issue are already framed. Consumer International should follow up for the effective implementation of the uh, guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Now, we do have someone who knows the ISO process quite well on the panel. Would you like to add anything, Rosemary? I am very happy with, uh, with the last speaker because I believe in standards. I think most of us as uh, consumer advocates do believe in standards and standards create fairness. They ensure that whatever product is, is, is being sold has really been seen to, to match the requirements and it should be fair, yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question, and I, I promised up the front here. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ann-Kathrin Hamacher from Germany, from EZTV. Thank you, <coughs> the panel. And so I see that balancing consumer interests and business interests is, is a challenge, but a pledge, a voluntary rules can only be a start because it cannot mm -hmm. replace uh, enforced, uh, enforceable regulation. So a pledge is in the sole discretion of the business. The business decides what to do and the con consumer has no say in it. So it, voluntary rules often do not help. Because when a product harms a consumer and they should receive damages for that, a pledge is nothing of help. So we need enforceable rules to, for the consumer so they can receive damages. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense. So, yeah, it's not enough to only have a pledge for consumers who need enforceable regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a final question for all of our panelists, and I might go to, do we still have our Manurama from Mauritius on camera? If not, we'll see if we can come back. So I'd like to challenge the panelists, thinking particularly ahead in the next three to five years, um, some of the big challenges we have in the product safety space. What do you think are the most effective things that consumer groups can do to create a, a safer world to address product safety issues? Oh, and Manurama, we've got you back. Would you like to answer this question first? Yes, so um, I think uh, advanced technology permits early detection of unsafe products before reaching the market. So with uh, blockchain, for supply chain uh, transparency, 
artificial intelligence for risk assessment, Internet of Things for product tracking, and significant, can significantly enhance product safety. Uh, also, international collaboration to have harmonized standards, rules, and legislation with a global approach to product safety is also important. And anticipating and addressing emerging risks such as new materials and technologies is as important. Businesses have to involve consumer associations during the conception, design, and development of products with emphasis on safety aspects. It's not the seller, the online seller, who is uh, ultimately responsible for product safety. It's the business producing these products. Thank you. Excuse me. Excuse me. Framework so that we have the right thing when the regulation is not there and doing the right thing. For consumer groups, actually we are leaning on consumer groups, experts, manufacturers, so to give those signals. So what I would say is the biggest challenge or the biggest next step could be a more collaborative environment where we have technology, like for an example, just recalls is one of the examples that you kept giving, and we have put a recalls page now globally, where you can see what is recalled in one place and what should cons consumers across the world do about it. So th those could be small steps, but uh, where we are looking for more help is more signals across regulators, government bodies, manufacturers, consumer forums, and how we can use that as signal and then distribute it back into the industry so that people can benefit out of it. And we can take faster decision when we see there are innovative products coming, the life cycle of product uh, time to market has changed. So to react faster, I think we need better collaboration and technology could be a backbone to disseminate this information faster and better. Rosemary, last word to you. Thank you. Uh, I think we need a collaborative voice where we educate consumers as consumer advocates to demand standards mm. of all products that are sold across the, the globe. Because if it is an international product, then it must also meet international standards. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our wonderful panelists. Thank you. And, and, and continue the conversation. I know that there's so much more to dig into here. Um, we'll break for coffee, um, and let's keep talking about product safety and all the wonderful voluntary and mandatory things we can do together. Thank you all.